Welcome to the Real Estate Sessions and join industry leaders as they share their stories and offer tips and advice to real estate professionals. Now your host, Bill Rissa of Chicago Title, Arizona. Welcome and thanks for checking out our tiny little corner of the vast podcast universe. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, please tell your friends. Check us out at therealestatesessions.com or we're on iTunes now. Uh, and for episode two, I am super excited to have Holly Mabry as our guest. Holly, a lot of people know Holly. Uh, she's a third generation Arizonan and third generation realtor. Talk about a rare combination. Uh, she's a northern Arizonan to be more specific. And I make that point for those listening outside the Grand Canyon state because we have a geographically diverse state from north to south. We're, we're not just a big desert, right, Holly? Absolutely. We got pine trees. We got lakes and rivers. We got it all. In Arizona, there's pine trees? Uh, pine <laughs> trees? You can ski in Arizona, Bill. We, In fact, this last winter, we had enough uh, snow and cottonwood. We've got kind of a pretty steep driveway. And when during the summer we typically kayak and you know spend a lot of time um, on the river and whatnot. So on New Year's Day we had enough snow on the driveway that my partner was literally in her kayak kayaking down the driveway. Nice. It's, I hope that's on video somewhere. It's totally on video. Are you kidding? It was hysterical. I got several sessions of it. We'll look for the link socially. Thank you. <laughs> Done. All right. So I, you know, I. I I've, I've known you since about 2010. Um, actually, we met online. We met on Twitter for the first time. I don't know if you remember that, but it was through Twitter. I saw you doing a few things and you were very nice and we had a conversation. Since then, I've you know seen you at tons of different events around the state. Um, but there was something I didn't know about you. And I don't think a lot of people know about your first job. So let's let's start with you're an NAU grad, a proud lumberjack. So a very proud lumberjack. Absolutely. Excellent. So what did you major in there? And tell us about your first job. Oh, Bill, it's so crazy. So I went to NAU with the hopes and dreams of going on to medical school. Well, I got into NAU and and was working through um, the biology program uh, with then Senator uh, John Wettop, who was just fantastic. But I was in his um, chemistry class and it was literally kicking my booty because um, chemistry on top of cellular molecular biology makes your hair fall out. Who knew? So midway through my junior year, I went, this is for the birds. I need to go find something that I really have a passion for. And my dad had been in radio before he had gone on to law school. And I went, you know what? That's it. I'm going to either go and study hotel restaurant management or I'm going to go into radio. So I took classes in both. Well, I could care less about the trends of I don't know, tourism and where people are going on vacation unless I'm the one going on vacation. So I really went full-fledged into radio, um, graduated with a, a degree in uh, broadcasting electronic media production and a minor in zoology. So there you go, Jack Hanna. Um, and actually started working for one of the local radio stations in Flagstaff before I graduated. I was their um, morning show co-host and I was their midday personality. I had a, you know, call-in show during the lunch hour, and then I worked weekends. I was, you know, Sunday mornings. I did a special thing, and then I worked Sunday, basically, you know, 8 p.m. to midnight. You name it, I was just anywhere I could be with regard to the radio. And I'm sure that's how most of those careers start, right? There's that's how you, you're doing everything at all hours of the day. You are you. You work well, and the other the other thing that nobody told tells you in college about radio. It sounds like this amazing, glamorous career, and at that time, you know, of course, uh, Howard Stern was just blowing up. He had his movie, he had you know his book come out, everything, and so you're looking at Howard Stern, and you've got Casey Kasem, and you've got all these people, and you're like, yeah, I'm doing this, and then you get your first paycheck, and you're like, oh my God, I I, I need to go get another job. So basically. Radio was this wonderful degree. Um, I, you know, I got my degree in, in, in broadcasting, but then um, radio was a fantastic habit. And I went and got two other jobs to support my radio habit. Gotcha. So one of the things we like to do is kind of get the backstory or like the real estate origin story. And I think we're kind of headed there right now. So um, because you had this, this family history of, of, of real estate kind of in the blood, is that what kind of led you down this path after you realized 
you know, maybe the compensation wasn't there in the radio biz? Yeah, I, I, I knew I needed to think a little bit bigger um, if I ever wanted to, um, I don't know, grow up, so to speak. And so I actually ended up moving back to Cottonwood. Um, my family had a, uh, and still does, a Chuck Wagon Supper and Western State Show, believe it or not. And at the time, they needed some help with marketing. So I gave up my career in radio uh, and went to work as uh, the uh, marketing person for our, our uh, family's ranch. And so I was traveling around and doing different things like that. But at the same time, you know, I was immensed with my family who is in real estate down here. My, my uncle is a broker owner of an office in Cottonwood. And so every night I'd have dinner you know, I'd be working at the ranch or whatever and spending a lot of quality time with them. Well, at that time, two of their top agents I became friends with and they approached me and they said, you know what, I, you're probably doing a great job in marketing, but you are missing the boat. You need to get into real estate. And so I went in and I, I interviewed with my uncle, which I will tell you, I think I cried during the interview. I was a terrible interview. It was awful. Because uh, I wanted an opportunity so badly, and I just I wasn't sure that he would hire me, um, and so it, it, which was crazy because he had already hired me to do the marketing. But you know, hire, I didn't realize real estate was um, a little bit different when it comes to hiring. So I was paranoid. Go in, I interview with my uncle. He's like, "Well, let's see if you can get your license first. So I went down to Scottsdale. I did uh, the nine-day crash course. Did it hit it out of the park, took my exam as fast as I could, aced it, and got back up here. And August 1st of 1998, I was like, all right, I'm ready. Let's go. Turn me loose. Wow. Um, that, that's great. Now, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. So you and your uncle hired you, obviously. My uncle fortunately hired me. Um, okay. And then at that point, he said, now you have to earn it. Okay. Now, um, you know, you've, I, you know, looking through your kind of your uh, your career, you've always kind of been at big brokerages, whether they're national or, or big regional brokerages, right? Maybe maybe more yeah. national. So you're obviously your uncle worked for one of those, and that was your first experience. Yes. Okay, and so you've yeah. you, you've never really left that world. And it, tell me why you like that so much. You know, it really worked for me to be in a um, a, a national brand, actually. Um, it, it just, it helped. Um, my uncle, of course, he owned the brokerage, so I wasn't going anywhere. Um, he had a contract with the national franchise and that's just what we did. Um, and at the time the, the office was one of the top sellers of real estate, you know, for like 25 years running in the Verde Valley and just did all these things. And I learned so much from my uncle. I learned so much also being part of that larger brand of, how to leverage myself, how to just kind of reach out in, in ways that I didn't realize were, were possible. you got to understand, Cottonwood is a very small kind of insulated town, so the idea of technology, um, you know, even though I was coming right out of college and, you know, I had my own email address and I had a beeper, dear God, um, you know, and a cell phone <laughs> before a lot of people did, um, coming to Cottonwood, I was one of the first agents to have a digital camera in the area back in the day when people would, you know, take a picture and take it down to Art Shutterbug and have, you know, 50 copies of the same picture made and, and uh, attach it to a flyer. And that's what you did. It's like, no, no, no. I, I was one week in the office and it was like, okay, I got to go get a computer. I got to go, I got to go do these things myself. And being part of the national brand absolutely opened my world. Um, and when I moved on from my uncle's office, I had some other opportunities. I stayed in that national world because of the technology, because of the opportunities to communicate with people doing things a little bit differently than I was. Um, and it has really worked out for me uh, to today. So you, could, who are you with now? Let's, we should put that out there. I, yeah, I, I'm with Realty One Group uh, Mountain Desert, which is a franchise um, owned, uh, we basically cover Northern Arizona from Lake Havasu, Flagstaff, Prescott, and the Verde Valley in Sedona. So it's it's kind of exciting. They're, they're a very young company. Um, the, the owner here locally is very young and, and excited and forward thinking and, and I'm, I'm very, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about what I can do to contribute to 
not only the success of the company, but also the, the people around me. Now, in your, you've been a designated broker before, right? You had a, a brief period of time where you fulfilled that role? Yes, I, I was a designated broker for Keller Williams um, uh, Czech Realty out of Northern Arizona, and I had 150 agents underneath me, and that was a wonderful learning experience, but I wasn't quite ready to dye my hair that much. <laughs> That's a lot of stress. All right. Um, and my hat's off to designated brokers, man. They, they pull people's booties out of the fire. They do a phenomenal job. So you don't see yourself heading back that way anytime soon, sounds like. Not, not at the moment. I'm having a lot of fun. Um, I love working with clients day to day. I love problem solving, helping them find their home um, or sell their home and, and create opportunities. Um, I really dig that. Um, I can definitely see myself eventually going back into that designated broker role, you know, one day when I'm a little bit older, but um, I'm, I'm having a little bit too much fun on the street and in the trenches, so to speak. You're, um, you talk about you know being involved with your customers. You're really involved in a lot of things. Let's first let's start with your your local and state association relationships. It, you are everywhere. You were president of AAR in 2012, and you know I'm sure there's you obviously you worked your way up through the ranks uh, to that point. Tell me why it's why you feel it's so important you know as a realtor to be involved in in what the associations are doing. You know for me. Um... I got involved at the local on the MLS committee, um, and I was my first year in business because I wanted to understand how that worked and how I could make it work better for me and my clients. And it, MLS is just a program, but I didn't know it back then because we were on a DOS system and it was kind of crazy. And so at the time, I helped our local board. I was on the MLS committee as we moved from basically away from the book to a DOS system and then forward to a um, internet-based um, MLS, which and was... You're talking about like 98, 99. This is not like in the 60s. This is, this is just a few yeah, years ago. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Th this is not that long ago, but, you know, there was a guy in my office up until probably 10 years ago. He still had the book. And so every once in a while, I'd go in and I'd look through it. I'm like, God, can, can, can you believe this history that we've got? Um, but yeah, to help move that forward. And so just, just really being forward thinking, I think where where I really got my taste of how being involved in that impact is I was working at the local level and we were working on our employment agreement for listings. And I had gone to my office manager who was kind of my mentor and I sat down with Audra and I said, look, you know, what, what are we missing in here? What do you see? And she was able to give me feedback and I was able to take that to the committee and a lot of people were like, yeah, that's a really good idea. And it went in and it was in writing and it changed some things of the way we did business in our local area. And so with that, being able to be that liaison between people, um, you know, between the board and actually taking people's good ideas and, and actually putting them into action um, it was very exciting. And I learned so much. I became a better agent. I was more on top of things. I was able to be more connected, um, and I think as I, I came through the ranks, I was president of the local in 2007, and I had the, the privilege of working with Frank Dickens, who was president of the Arizona Association of Realtors in 2007, and getting to work with him on the state level and see what he was working on nationally, um, I knew I wanted to bring back to rural Arizona. I, I, I knew there needed to be a voice, and and Frank was from Flagstaff and, and doing a phenomenal job, but I didn't want any gaps. And so I spent a lot of time talking with family and, and Frank and, and other leaders at AAR about um, moving up the chairs there. And and that was what was so exciting, Bill, is, is to actually work with our members across the state and see what their needs were and go back to AAR and actually work on them and actually bring them back either a finished product or information or answers of, of, of what could be done to solve their problems. So it was it was basically problem solving and and all those things that we get to do on a day to day basis with our clients. I was getting to to do for my tribe, right? You know, Seth Godin in his book right. Tribes talks about you know your people. These right. were my people, and so how do I get to go and take care of my people who I get to do business with on a daily basis? And that was. Um, 
I, I, I'm still very energized about it today, in case you couldn't tell, um, <laughs> because of, of what you get to do. And so being president of AAR was just kind of that culmination of awesomeness, uh, of getting to really say, I'm with these people, I'm with the state of Arizona, and you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm here to represent them, so what can we do for you was just really really special and then traveling the state meeting these people and now getting to work at NAR I get to serve on a couple of committees there um, land use property rights and environment um, as well as um, uh, resort and second home and and so looking at the issues that come out of those two committees and bringing them back to the state uh, association and bringing them back to my local because they absolutely impact us um, has been just a blast and it's made me better for my clients I'm a better realtor because of my involvement those two committees especially like you said so important to the state um, so to say you're politically active is probably an understatement um, <laughs> and if, <laughs> if anyone's been to any event in the state where we're gonna talk about RAPAC the Realtor Political Action Committee the first thing that comes up is yours so I you know I know you could talk about this topic for hours but give us, you know, that four, two, three, four minute version of why RAPAC is so important and why it's got to be supported. You know, I, I think for me, again, because real estate, what I love about the Realtor organization is we are one of the, in fact, I think we are the only organization nationally, locally, or statewide that actually goes in front of our legislature or our elected officials and absolutely lobbies on behalf of more than just our personal interests. Um, we're lobbying private property rights, we're lobbying home ownership, people's ability to get loans, and that's a phenomenal thing. When you start to look at it, realtors are truly, you know, we're that first contact when people come into a community, you know, hey, I, I'm thinking about moving to Sedona, what can you tell me about, you know, people that move here and they're like, gosh, where do I get my hair cut? Where do I take my dog to the, the groomer or to the vet? All of those things, we truly are that backbone of the community. And I, I look at Ray Pack as just that next layer of helping protect my clients as well as insurance in my business. Because, you know, that old adage, Reagan said it best, well, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. Dear Lord. Right. So if, if you look at that, at Ray Pack, you know, the, the, the $5,000 or the $2,500 that I give every year uh, in, in, in that um, investment is truly in investing in protecting my people, again, my tribe. It's protecting my business, it's protecting the people that I love, it's protecting homeowners, and it's protecting you know, my nieces and nephews' ability to buy a house when they grow up. That's a pretty good investment to me. Yeah, I, and it, I could, it, you are so passionate about that topic. It's um, something I look forward to at every state event <laughs> in Arizona. So keep it up, it's yeah. amazing. Well, thank you. And, and I think you know a lot of people are like, oh, she's into politics. You know, I don't, I like to watch and see what's going on, but the devil's in the details. And and truly, you know, we are governed by those that participate. And so, if you don't go out and vote, if you if you're not, you know, actively kind of watching what's going on, case in point, what's going on with the Animas River right now, right. And the EPA dump of all that crap. Sorry, I'm just beside myself. We went kayaking or um. Uh, whitewater rafting on the Animus last year, and I've got a lot of friends who live in Denver, and now it's going to hit Lake Powell, which is like my favorite place in the world. Oh my God! And and this is the EPA. This is government, and the EPA has come in and passed the Clean Up Water Act, saying, "Look, you know what? We're going to regulate every water uh, way, mud puddle, so on and so forth." And that absolutely cuts to the heart of private property rights, and that alone. You say EPA Clean Water Act. That's that's why I invest in my uh, in RAPAC. But you know that's for another time. We can go on and on about that. Well, let's. Let, I'll switch gears slightly. Not not really too much. Um, you're really involved in education on a lot of different levels. Uh, and, and in fact, you you know you have a lot of certifications yourself that all kind of apply to what you were talking about. That that tie back to what's important to you and your tribe. But you also started a training and consulting company, correct? We did. We, um, I, when I was designated broker um, for Keller Williams, um, 
I was watching a lot of our agents come through and they were just struggling. The, the new agents were struggling. The market was um, healing, if you will. And at that time, I sat down um, with uh, Stacy on and my business partner, and we just brainstormed. Um, sometimes it was over coffee, sometimes it was over beer, but it was like, all right, how we got to do something. How do we start to help these agents, particularly in the outlying areas? We're willing to drive hundreds of miles, travel all over the country to go learn more and be better. And how do we bring that home? And how do we give them a benefit? And a lot of times um, that benefit is not necessarily in the nugget of education, but in, hey, you got to have CE in order to renew your license. So how can we help you? And so that was our thought of how do we package that real life in the trenches case study scenarios and bring that home um, really so our next transaction goes easier. If we were on the other side or within our office or new agents that we were mentoring, their transactions go better. They, we know they're getting first rate education, not necessarily because it was being taught by us, but we were bringing their material to them. And so the, the challenge really became, okay, how do we become some of the best instructors we can possibly be? What does that look like? Where do we go get that information? How do we stay on top of it? And then how do we continue to keep it fresh and communicate it with, our, with the other agents around us? And it has been an amazing uh, challenge. It has been um, a blast. Every class I get to teach, I walk out with as much good information as I, I hope the the agents that are in class with me do, because um, I, I look at it as a is a huge mastermind. It's like, all right, we get to spend the next three hours or the next six hours together. Let's hit it out of the park. What are you guys struggling with? How can we solve these problems together? And oh, by the way, did you know? Did you know? this might help you in your agency? Did you know this might help you um, in your disclosure? This is a new legal thing that's happening right now. Um, so it's been, it's been fantastic um, and a little bit crazy. Um, but again, it's, 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 helped, it's helped me be better, but also give back to my tribe, which I feel like has given me a lot, um, especially over the last you know, 15, 16 years. I like that you, you, uh, you're very honest and there's a slightly selfish reason for doing it. Why not, you know, using another term, raise the bar. Why not make everyone a little better? Because the next time you have that cross sale with that agent, you know, they know what they're doing. That's great. Absolutely. If, if, if I can, ha if I can share something with an agent that will make them a little bit better or help them make their next transaction smoother, that client has a better transaction that client now respects their agent more, which inadvertently respects me because we're part of the same tribe. So I, I consider that a win because um, not every win is monetary. I, I can't, uh, you know, since we're in trid season, I have to ask you this question, you know, what's your, <laughs> uh, I, I've, I've taught 44 trid classes myself in the last two months. And I just want to know your take. What are your thoughts as we head to October 3rd? Are you um, positive about the changes? Are you, are you a little wary? Where do you, where do you come down on that? You know, I, I, in the beginning, and I'll admit, maybe a year ago, six months ago, I was, I was a little nervous about the changes to TRID. Um, but I think I'm on my 10th class as an agent. I haven't taught any. I've been too immersed in, okay, how do I get my head around this? Um, and so as an agent right now, looking at TRID changes, I'm actually pretty excited the way it will be better for uh, the buyer coming in. Right. I think the buy, it will be very clear for the buyer. It will be um, easier to read and understand, which I really like. Um, and I'm, I'm excited about that. I think it's the learning curve is definitely the industry. Um, um, what I appreciate about TRID is there's no when we start to look at the timelines, there's no real place to hide. If you screw up, whether it's on the my end as an agent or say the lender has a, a snafu or even title, it's going to show. The error is going to be glaring and we get to fix it together. Um, so I like that opportunity. Um, I like that um, we're all being held to a higher standard in that respect. Um, 
and honestly, the the so many of the classes I've taken, Bill, have have really been from the uh, viewpoint of of the lender or the title person, which I so appreciate. I love crawling into you guys' heads, even just for a nanosecond, to understand what you guys are going through. Um, it's going to be interesting after October third how the uh, how the situation morphs a little bit because now we as agents can start masterminding and having those conversations of what we need to do better I think until we get our boots on the ground you know October 3rd October 4th and our closings thereafter um, what little tweaks we need to make in our business to make sure that we're writing tighter contracts um, that we are uh, you know adjusting our timelines appropriately in our in our follow-up our, our tickling system if you will okay on this day I need to make sure I'm calling all my lenders and you know where am I at on this file and so forth um, the other thing that I'm kind of fascinated to see is just you know how how we're going to communicate with one another and that's agent to agent not necessarily agent to title or agent to lender because I think the the lenders and the title folks you guys really have it ironed out for us um, I, I don't think TRID is going to be as big a deal as I thought it was going to be six months ago where I was really nervous. I think there are going to be other changes that are going to ripple through the process. Um, and quite frankly, one of my biggest concerns right now are our appraisals. Um, our lack of appraisers as we go forward over the next, gosh, next five to ten years, because it's so rigorous to get your appraisal license. Um, that we have very few people doing it at the moment, and I'm just wondering if we aren't headed for, I don't know, um, kind of a, a void, a vacuum where we're not going to have enough appraisers, and so our time frame for appraisers is uh, is actually going to swell from, I don't know, I don't know, 10, I don't know, 10, you know, 10, 15, just because the appraisers are going to be so just bogged down with orders. Uh, regulations and paperwork that they have to turn around. That's an interesting um, take. And I, I think that's yeah. probably going to have the most. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, I, you know, I really haven't heard that one very much. You know, from the appraisal point of view, I know critical. Um, the critical aspect is an appraiser coming back and saying, "Oh, yeah, I, I had, I need to charge a different amount than what we quoted on the loan estimate because the house is bigger, had this issue, had some other stuff." And those kinds of things, you know, that they now fall into that variation area of it can't change at all. That's a big problem. Right. So I hear that appraisers and, and uh, you know, the, the associations are working together between lenders and appraisers to try and come with some kind of more of a flat rate, fixed rate kind of appraisal fee to prevent that from happening. Because that's a real tough situation. Um, so we'll have to see how that goes. Yeah, I think I think that's well, iron. Hopefully, <laughs> knock on wood, we'll iron that out. You know, within the first six months, I, I just, you know, looking at our long game and short game, I, it's going to be interesting. But from an agent point of view, I think, you know, personally with my my clients, I'm trying to prep my sellers right now that look, I just want you to start building in a little extra time for closing. Um, we're we're probably not going to see 30 days. Uh, I know some lenders are telling me that we'll still be able to do it, and bless their hearts. But I think there's too many extenuating factors. I think. Right now, our home inspectors are backed up because the market has picked up so much, um, and then I think our appraisers are backed up. And especially if we start to see a bump in interest rates, will that hit another refi boom? Right. So eh, it's kind <laughs> of a, a weird little storm that's headed our way. Um, but I like I like the changes I see out of Trid. Um, it will just keep us as agents a bit more honest long term right well with our I'll, time frames. I'll share one thing with you uh, the I had a great uh, so it might have been might have been session 26 and we had a, a an agent a woman who um, stood up and she said look you know the communication level between realtor and buyer and realtor and seller is going to become so important and she said look the way it is now when I sit to sit down with my buyer I have an entire conversation that basically says the lender is going to ask you for the same documentation four times over the next 30 days. And you're going to do it with a smile as fast as you can every time. And I love the fact that she was setting these expectations early because I think I know in trade, you're going to add a few more expectations like the loan estimate is going to come out and you have to give them an intent to proceed. So when you're ready to do that, don't don't let that delay or, you know, um, 
if if we're going to do something towards the end of the escrow, it's going to have an effect. So we have to check with the lender. But it's really cool as a realtor if you can set those expectations with your customers. That that's a huge help, right? It, it, what a novel concept! We're actually going to tell people <clears throat> what they can expect. I didn't want to say. I, I mean, it's. It, I know it, it, it's one of those things. I think that you know when the when the market was so stupid uh, in 03, 04, 05, even first part of 06, we were. We were just holding on for dear life. It was like the roller coaster where you knew something was coming, but you weren't sure, and you were just almost a yes man. And then when the market crashed, we had to be honest with people. I mean, the number of people I sat at their kitchen table and held their hands to tell them that, man, I'm sorry, we're going to have to short sale your house, was it was devastating. I, I There were so many days I just sat and cried with clients. Um, and, and so... It's tough to tell anymore when I when people hire me, whether it's a listing or to be their buyer's rep, I'll sit them down and say, look, you're hiring me to tell you the truth. I'm not always going to say what you want to hear, but my job is to keep you out of trouble, let you know where the cliffs are, and let you know what could harm you later on. That is my job, and I'm going to not sugarcoat that. And, and so part of that is, look, they are going to pull your credit the day of close. They are going to check your income verification the day of close. So if you called in sick for the last week and that's impacted your, you know, your hourly pay scale, yeah, you could lose this house. And so having those types of, it's not just going out and getting a Target credit card anymore. It's calling in sick. We, we lost a deal over that because wow. a young girl just kept calling in sick and I was like stop it what are you doing um, so the 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 honesty factor um, it really is going to be a neat opportunity I think for agents to really show their value to their clients and the really good agents are just going to shine um, their ability to communicate and their ability to translate and make this a seamless process um, because the the trade disclosures, they're do, helping us do that. They're they're taking some of the legal mumbo jumbo out, but we've got to set people up for success. Of no, you can't go look at houses until you've met with the lender. Because if you don't have these things in order, oh my God, you're looking at a 60 day close, and that's insane, right. or a 90 day close, and you could lose your loan lock. So those types of things, I I'm excited. I'm excited for what that will mean to our industry. You know, talk to me this time next year. Uh, that's a deal. We'll do that. I, I'm I'm very Pollyannish <laughs> on this whole situation. I feel that give us a few months. By the spring of 2016, things will be rolling. Everything will be fine. We, we're we're smart people. We'll figure it out. So now I I can't. I would be really um, kicking myself if I didn't bring up something that I know you're going to love to talk about, and that is you you have a very particular hidden talent. And uh, I actually made you, I guess, submit on that talent. And you, <laughs> and you spoke about this talent at Ignite Phoenix, and it is on YouTube. So anyone that wants to go to YouTube and type in Holly's name and the words Ignite Phoenix will get to watch this presentation. But Holly, please tell everyone who's listening what your hidden talent is. I'm a bad piper. I'm, I'm a piper. I started... Um, I started playing the bagpipes as a freshman in high school, and yes, I went to bagpipe camp, and I competed, and I got to do all these amazing things. I've done weddings and funerals and weird little ceremonies, this and that, and I loved it. I love the history of it. Um, you know, uh, if, if somebody starts playing the pipes, because they're so loud, you can hear them 10 miles away, uh, somebody starts playing the pipes, and I'm hooked. I It's... I have, you know, I've got Pandora always running in the background when I'm working in my home office. And yes, I have a bagpipe station. So I'm not only am I a real estate nerd, I am a total bagpipe geek. And so I'm just going to cover every, every um, facet in that respect. But Bill, I got to tell you, Ignite Phoenix, um, when I got to go down and do that, and actually... I, I picked up on it from um, Jay Thompson, 
and and what he had done and then getting to see yours and getting to know you more and then uh, Elizabeth Newland seeing hers which was fantastic we actually went to ignite and um, that was one of my goals I walked out of ignite Phoenix that first time that I went just as a as a um, a viewer or a member of the crowd and I walked out and I, I told everybody I was with I said I am doing that next year I will be on that stage I am presenting and they're like well, what are you gonna present on doesn't matter I'm gonna be on that stage I want that challenge of doing it and Bill it was the coolest challenge I'm so thankful that uh, you kept standing in my way and saying no no you got you got no nope, really you gotta do this and so for anybody out there um, Ignite is, uh, it started in Portland, is that right, Bill? Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually, it's kind of a national, um, Portland might be the oldest. There's now like 60 or 70 Ignites around the country. O'Reilly Media started it back in the day. So you kind of kind of think like a really mini version of TED, a five-minute version, you know, real short. Kind yeah, of. It, yeah, if you get the chance, you've got to do it. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. It's funny. It's, it's wonderful to be a member of the audience, but if you are looking to, to um, if you like to speak and you like to entertain or you think you might like to, uh, audition for Ignite. It, uh, it was one of the coolest things I think I've ever done. So thank you for that, Bill. Well, you were great. I, I, can't, I can't thank you enough. It was awesome to have you there. So we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up, but there's one question I'd like to kind of finish with. So far, this is our second episode, so I'm going to stick with it. And <laughs> the, uh, the question <laughs> is this. If, if you had one piece of advice to give to an agent today, just one piece, you know, what's it going to be? I know that's tough, but just one thing. Wow. Know your value. Know your value. You have an inherent value. You got into this business with some kind of idea or passion of, of, of something, and it doesn't matter if you were dirt broke and living with your grandmother, which I was, um, or you had a family history in it, or you just wanted to make money or just sell your own home you have a value and if you know what that value is and you can articulate that value then your clients will respect you more your cross agents will respect you more and not in an arrogant way but your ability to earn people's business by knowing your value and how you show up makes all the difference in the world so so know that value know what you bring to the table because it's a tremendous amount Thank you very much, Holly. I, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to be our second guest on the Real Estate Sessions. Do you, if people want to reach out to you, are you comfortable giving out a website or some contact information? Absolutely. Would love to, to chat with anybody. And if, if I can ever be of service um, or answer any questions, um, my, my website is azheartland.com. Uh, and uh, it's uh, all, obviously all one word, but azheartland.com. Or you can reach me at hmabry at gmail.com. Excellent. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope to have you back on in about a year. We'll have another conversation about where we're at post-trid. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, everybody else, we'll, uh, we'll see you on the next episode of The Real Estate Sessions. Thanks for joining. You've been listening to The Real Estate Sessions with Bill Rissa of Chicago Title, Arizona. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and tell your friends about the Real Estate Sessions as new episodes are published weekly.